chapter 13, and we're going to finish out this chapter today, the Lord willing, unless the trumpet sounds, and then we won't care. All right. John chapter number 13, verse number 31. Therefore, when he was gone out, he is Judas, if you remember from last week. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye, lo that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Well, Father, again, just a very probing portion of Scripture here. And I'm asking that you'll help us to have an understanding. There may be today, God, those that don't know the Lord Jesus as their Savior, and I pray that you will help them to understand their need, and they'll be saved. And I pray for believers that we will be conformed to the image of Christ, that we'll be prepared to receive the truth of the Bible, that we'll allow the Spirit of God and the Word of God to examine our hearts and to probe around and to show us who we are and what we are. And it may be, God, that you reveal to us that we're in the right way. It may be that you reveal that we're not. And either way, I would pray that you would be able to achieve in us what you desire to achieve. Father, I'm glad that we're here. You knew who would be here today. You knew the message that would be preached. You knew the words that would be spoken before we even arrived here. And so now we commit it into your hands, and we ask you, God, please, to achieve what you want to achieve. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <clears throat> well, the events of John chapter 13 have been really confrontational. Would you agree with that? Amen. Very confrontational chapter here. Peter's refusal to have his feet washed. You're not going to wash my feet, Lord. Uh, that was the first part of the uh, confrontation that started. And then he declares, as we just saw last week, he, he, he declares uh, who, that he would be betrayed. Jesus declares that he'd be betrayed, and he ultimately points out who would betray him. Although he didn't say the name of Judas, he, we remember the passages well enough to know that it was clear, even though the disciples seemed a little bit confused about that. In that room that night, <clears throat> I think it's safe to say that the emotions were running fairly high, and there is certainly a lot taking place that not everybody has a grasp on except Jesus. Now, as this chapter closes out, the Lord is going to give the remaining 11 disciples a lesson and a new commandment, and there's going to be yet another confrontation. See, Judas wasn't the only one in that room that night that had a problem. We're going to see that Peter also had a problem, and it might be a problem that we have. And I would say that Peter, although he becomes the spokesperson here, uh, it's quite likely that the other disciples themselves also had some things to get worked out. And uh, we can't presume too much because the Bible doesn't say so, but certainly they had their own issues that needed to be sorted as well. Now in this passage is what I predominantly want to take away from it is I want to deal with the new commandment that Jesus Christ gave. But in order to deal with it verse by verse as we have been, I'd like to go right through each verse 
and uh, show you how it all pertains to the same topic. So the first thing I'd like you to notice with me today is that Jesus spoke of his glorification. His glorification. And as we go through this, I want you to see something that it's going to not only not declare that Jesus wasn't God, it's going to emphasize that he was God. It's going to show that clearly, okay? So let's speak about his glorification. Verse number 31 says that, Therefore, when he, that's Judas, was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. So it's the new commandment that's going to be given is going to be given as a result of what's taking place. And so Judas goes out of the room. And I'm going to do as I always do. I want to draw principles out of each of these scriptures because all of the word of God is profitable to us. I'm going to draw these principles out. We'll come to this new commandment. Now, the principle that I'd like you to see here is this, that once Judas had gone out, that Jesus was able to speak more freely with his disciples. We've seen this throughout the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, that often he withheld what he wanted to speak to his disciples about, whilst in the presence of unbelieving Jews... He wouldn't say certain things in their presence, and then later he would pull them aside and make an explanation of what he was talking about. Sometimes they would ask, and he would make an explanation on what they were asking about and things that he had said. But there were a number of times that Jesus would withhold things from the general crowd and wait till another time to say it. In this passage of Scripture, rather, what we see is this that Jesus withheld some of his greatest instruction to the twelve. This is, this is an intense evening of teaching by Jesus to the, tw- to the eleven, sorry. It's going to be an intense evening, and he's going to just keep teaching and teaching and teaching and instructing and commanding right through the evening, right up until the time he's arrested. And even after his arrest, there's going to be things that take place during the trials and then the, 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 the floggings. All of that's going to be time where he's instructing those those other 11 disciples. But he waits until, excuse me, the devil is gone to give the instruction on the new commandment. Now think about that. There have been occasions where in a preaching service, for instance, that I have felt very restricted in being able to say some things. There's just a sense that the Spirit of God saying, you can't say that, not now. There's some who can't bear it. Or there's some who won't bear it, they, they'll, they'll refuse it. There's other times in a preaching or a teaching service that I've felt absolute liberty to speak. Sometimes I've seen that there's been some that have just gotten up and gone. And as they go, the, the, the oppression of the service lifts. And you, there's a freedom and there's a liberty there. What I'm saying is just simply this. We need to recognize sometimes that there is a hindrance in the instruction of God, whether it's a preaching or a teaching time, or even sometimes even in our own personal devotion, there can be a hindrance there because the devil's present or a devil is present. And it's hindering what Jesus wants to speak to us about or wants to instruct us in. And so Jesus here waits for Judas to depart before he opens up this intimate conversation with the disciples about the new commandment and the things that follow. Now, as he speaks of his glorification, he says there in verse number 31, the second part, now is the Son of Man glorified. Now, presently, he's glorified. And very simply, again, it's just this that following the betrayal of Judas, of Jesus Christ by Judas, I should say, following that, there's a point of no return. And as far as Jesus is concerned, the wheels have been set in motion. Nothing's going to turn that around. And, is, and Jesus looks at it as, now I'm glorified. We look at it and we think, wow, there's still, there's quite a, a period of time. There's a, there's, Not quite a whole day left, but there's the best part of a 24-hour period left when there's going to be a lot take place, whether it's the journey to Gethsemane to pray, whether it's the the arrest, then the the kangaroo court and trial, whether it's the the flogging, whether it's the two um, standings before Pilate and, and Herod and back to Pilate again. There's a lot of things taking place there, but all of it's going to go according to the plan of God And this is what Jesus has been saying regarding his glorification to the disciples 
for a, a period of time now. I'm going to be glorified. <clears throat> and he's announcing to them that night, as Judas goes out, now I'm glorified. I'm going to the cross. I'm giving my life. Nothing can change that. Satan even has a hand in fulfilling my will. That's kind of hard sometimes to, to think of it that way, isn't it? But that just shows you the subjection that even Satan himself has to Almighty God. He is not a power even close to equivalent to the Lord. He is, in, he is under the, the control, the power, the authority of God at all times. And if God wants to use Satan to accomplish his will so that he can be glorified, that's how he'll do it. And that ought to give us joy in our heart. Sometimes we get this idea that the devil's really, really powerful and there's a power struggle back and forth between God and Satan. That's not the case. God is always in control, always in authority. The devil is always in subjection and he always will be and he will never be able to even hold a candle to the power of Almighty God. Thank the Lord for that. But now, he says, now is the Son of Man glorified. And then he says some things here that are just so, they're so interesting to me and in how he says it and it shows the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, now is the Son of Man glorified and God is glorified in Him. As the Son of Man is being glorified, God is being glorified. He doesn't use the name Father here. He uses the name God in a reference to the Godhead. And so he speaks to him, he speaks and says that as I'm glorified, God is glorified. Verse 32, and if God, and if you let me say the Godhead, because this is, this is what he's trying to communicate here. This, it's not what he's trying to communicate. It's what he's communicating. God, if God be glorified in the Lord Jesus, God shall also then reciprocate that and glorify Jesus or glorify him in himself. So we look at what commonly called the Trinity. I just prefer to use the, the Bible term, the Godhead. And we see these three people. And Jesus as the Son of Man, as, the, as God in the flesh on the earth, is going to go to the cross. And, and he says, I am going to be glorified in what I'm doing. And as I'm doing that, God will be glorified in what I'm doing. And because God is glorified in what I'm doing, God is now going to glorify me in Him, in my position in the Godhead or in the Trinity, if you like. I'm going to be glorified in my position. We need to give glory to God. We need to, be, we need to give glory to the Father. We need to give glory to the Holy Spirit. We need to give glory to the Son. And God has arranged it so that when Jesus Christ is lifted up, when Jesus is glorified and we glorify Him, God says, I'm receiving the glory, so give it to the Lord Jesus. That's where I want it to lie. It is not taking away from the deity of Jesus. It is emphasizing the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, look, I want you to, glorif to be glorified, God, and in reciprocal of that, you're going to glorify me. That's a blessing, guys. It just shows you that everything that was taking place as awful as it was, was pleasing to God. Somebody, uh, I keep bringing this up. I guess it's fresh in my mind. We covered so much territory in a conversation, but I had a, a conversation with a woman this past week in regard to things like this. And she was trying to establish about how bad God is that she would, that he, sorry, that he would, uh, <clears throat> that he would, Make it the, his will for his son to die such a cruel death. And I said, you're missing the point. It was the Lord Jesus in a voluntary fashion giving his life as God in the flesh so that mankind could be saved, so that you could be delivered from your sin. That was the choice he made. Was it the will of God? Yes, it was the will of God. It was the will of Jesus' will uh, as well. Well, what about, nevertheless, you know, God, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. If redemption can come in another way, Father, let it come in another way, but it will not come in another way. Nevertheless, 
Not as I will, but as thou wilt. As the Son of Man, he subjected himself to the will of the Father. Over and over again, Jesus Christ declared his deity. And he declared his deity as he spoke of his glorification. And if he's not God, then he's stealing glory from God. But he is God. And so it just compounds the glory that God gets. Secondly, verse number 33, Jesus spoke of his departing. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, Jesus spoke of departing. Notice this phrase he uses, little children, little children. I notice again that it was when Judas departed that Jesus then was able to speak with this association and tenderness to the remaining 11. And that's the two things that I see in that phrase, little children. He's associating himself with them. If you know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you can rejoice and rest in the fact that he is pleased to call you brethren, that he is rejoicing in your relationship with him, that we enter into the family of God with him. That, is, that should bring us great joy to know that I am a part of the family of God, that I am a son of God by the redemption of Jesus Christ. He is pleased to be associated with the unworthy person named Kevin Byer. And you put your name in that place. Jesus is pleased to be associated with you. And he comes in there, he says, little children. That is such a term of endearment and of tenderness. And it stuck so much in the heart of the apostle John that nine times in his first epistle, one John, John took that phrase and turned it to the people that he was ministering to. And nine times John says to him through the, through the spirit of God, he says, little children, little children, little children. John was glad to be associated with that other group of believers that he was writing to. He was, associ he was not only associated, but he was tender about them. He cared about them. Guys, do you see what I'm getting to here? Jesus Christ looked at those disciples, and he has the same tenderness toward you and I. And he says, I am so glad that you can be with me, little children. And he says, little children, I am with you. <laughs> we sang this morning, no, never alone. Never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. And he said, I am with you. Yet a little while I am with you. Yes, he'd be betrayed, but I'm with you right now. <clears throat> I'm just picking up little lessons, okay? There may be times that you feel like God's not present with you, that the Lord Jesus isn't present with you. But he's present with you right now. I'm with you right now. There may be those times that you feel like he's been taken away, that the presence and the tenderness of the Lord has been removed from you. But you know what he says to you? I'm with you. I'm with you. You're present with me and I'm with you. Yes, physically he would be taken away from him, but spiritually he'd never be taken away. And we're going to learn in just a couple of chapters, he says, it's expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, then the Comforter will not come. Do you, do you understand how important it was for the Lord Jesus to be crucified, buried, risen, and ascend into heaven so that the Holy Spirit of God could come down and dwell in us and with us? If that didn't happen, then that means that Jesus could only be in one physical location at a time. And I don't think that we're proud enough to say about ourselves, well, surely he would choose us. And we would always have to be yearning for the presence of Christ. Because he was willing to go away, we now have the presence of Christ no matter where we are. I'm going to go to my home today, and the Lord Jesus, through the Spirit of Christ, will be with me. You're going to go to your home, and he'll be with you. Amen. We could fly halfway around the world, and he'll still be with us. 
You know, Jesus is reminding them here that, yes, physically, I'm here just for a little while, but I'm with you now. You value the time you have with the Lord Jesus. And can I say this, too, is just another sort of, this is a little looser application, okay? I admit it right up front, that this is a looser application. But, you know, when we come together and the, and the, the Word of God is being taught and it's being preached and the instruction of the Spirit of God is taking place, we need to value that time. We should value that time. Guys, be rested. I'm speaking very practically here. Be rested and prepared to receive the preaching of the Bible when you come here. We just have a little while together. It's just a little bit of time. And if you're nodding off and sleeping or you, you can't keep your eyes open and you're just having all of this trouble and you, you've allowed the world to come in with you and your mind's preoccupied with things, you're going to miss this little time together. Don't miss the little time that we have. Use your devotion time. Treasure it. You say, I may only get 15, 20, 30 minutes a day of my quiet time. You don't believe how busy my schedule is. First of all, I can probably help you with that. But secondly, if I can't, treasure the little time that you have. Amen. Yet a little while I'm with you. You better treasure it. And he says there again in verse number yet a little while I am with you. And then he goes on and says, ye shall seek me. Well, it would be totally natural for them to seek after Jesus Christ. They've just spent these years with him in his earthly ministry. They've given up everything to follow him. It would be natural for them to go seek for his presence again. And he said, you're going to seek me. But then he made a statement to them that may have shocked them. And as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. Well, wait a minute. We gave up everything to follow you and to be with you. What do you mean now we're going to be treated just like the Jews and we can't go where you're going? Wait a minute. And that's when Peter's going to pipe up and say, wait, I don't like this. We'll learn about that in just a minute. I want you to notice some differences, though, between what Jesus was saying to the unsaved Jews and what he was saying to these disciples. Keep your finger here and look over at John chapter number 7. John chapter number 7. You doing okay? Amen. All right. In John chapter number 7, verses 33 to 36. Then said Jesus unto them, Yet a little while am I with you, and then I go unto him that sent me. Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, thither ye cannot come. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whither will he go that we shall not find him? Will, we go, will he go to the dispersed among the Gentiles, and teach the Gentiles? What manner of saying is this, that he said, Ye shall seek me, and shall not find me. And where I am, whither ye cannot come. Thither ye cannot come. Now let's come over here to chapter 8 and verse number 21. As Jesus gives them, an explanation. Uh, did I say Jesus? You know what? I am so muddled up in my mind this morning, and I don't know why. I just have so many thoughts floating around. John 8, verse 21, and if I said a wrong name there, I apologize. The title, I think I did. Verse number 21, Then said Jesus again unto them, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. You know why I told those Jews that they couldn't go with him? They're lost. They can never go where he's going. They can never be where he's going to be. They're lost in their sins. Whither I go, he said, ye cannot come. Oh, there's a big difference, though, between what he said to them and what he's saying to those, to those disciples. Look at verse number 36 of John 13. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus said unto, answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me. What's the next word? Now. You can't go now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Yeah. You know, that statement, it must have just shocked him when he said, I'm telling you what I told the Jews, you can't go whither I'm going. But you know, for them it was because you're lost in your sins, and there is no sin going to enter into that heaven. But to some, it's just wait. And that's an important lesson. Just wait. It's not that I don't want you with me. 
It's that you're not ready to be there, not yet. And you can't come now, but you will. You know, those disciples, they had some work to be done. They had some things that Jesus needed them to do. He was going to leave them behind to, to evangelize the world. Amen. They had work to do. They had work to do in their hearts. In this very passage, God is going to draw some things out of Peter that I think we might find to be true of ourselves as well. He's going to draw that out. You're not ready yet, Peter. Not yet. And you can't go right now. And we've got to be very careful about getting impatient with the Lord. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's go on. Verse 34 and 35. Jesus now speaks of a new commandment. And he said in verse 34, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye, lo ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. All right? He spoke of a new commandment. Love one another. Now someone would foolishly say, Oh, so love wasn't part of the Old Testament law? No, that's not right. He most certainly did command people to love one another in the Old Testament. Leviticus 19, verse number 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord. Was it that God had never commanded love before? No, that's not at all what Jesus was saying. Look at verse 34 again. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, exclamation now, or explanation I mean to say, as I have loved you, that ye love also one another. Wow. They have the example of Jesus Christ to follow now. It's no longer loving one another based on what they think might be right. It's no longer just withholding getting even with someone. Well, I won't give, get even with them because God told me not to, not to grudge them and not to avenge myself. Now it's a matter of I'm going to love them because I saw how Jesus Christ loved. I'm going to behave myself the way he behaved. Guys, this has been the plan of God from the very beginning that we would be like Jesus. When he Just moving back into verse 33 again, as we talk about those Jews who couldn't go with God, at their, with Christ at that time. Why? Because they're lost in their sins and they would never, ever, ever be like Jesus Christ unless they would repent and put their faith in Christ. If they would do that, everything would change. But until a person puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only can they not go with him and be with him, they can't love like him. You and I cannot love properly until we are trying to do it the way Jesus Christ did it, and we can't do it unless we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. It's simply not possible. We would drive ourselves mad trying to emulate the Lord Jesus Christ without having the Spirit of Christ in us. They now have His example. They're going to have the indwelling Spirit of God. <clears throat> and He said to them, <clears throat> pardon me, that this would be then the evidence that all men would be able to look at that they were the disciples of Jesus Christ. It seems easy enough to say love one another, but it is not easy to love one another. Amen. It's a lot more than me saying, I love you. It is a whole lot more than me buying flowers. <laughs> for someone or giving chocolate those may be expressions of love that I might show to my wife I might give you a gift and that might be an expression of love but genuine love the way Jesus Christ showed it is, is far beyond buying flowers and giving chockies okay he said, I want the evidence that I live in you to come out of you. And I, when men see that, they'll know that you're my disciples. <clears throat> Jesus Christ had supplied the needs of those, those disciples who left their labors to follow him. He'd supplied their needs. 
Jesus had done, and, and this goes back to something I've already preached on, and I want you to receive this. Please receive this as it's intended. But Jesus Christ had both confronted and corrected and rebuked those disciples. And you know what that was? It was his love. Do you know one of the problems that our society has today? It's to think that if you're corrected or you're told that you're wrong, that someone doesn't love you. Amen. When just the opposite is true. Amen. The greatest love a parent shows for their children is disciplining them and training them and teaching them what is right in the eyes of God. And if we don't do that, we can call it love all we want. God said, that is not love. He said, you hate your children if you don't show them the right way, what's right and what's good, and teach them to love God. That's not love, that's hate, he said. Amen. And the same thing is true when the Lord is working in our lives <clears throat> and when we are working with one another. There is a time, and we have to have this relationship with each other. We've got to be able to trust one another. To be able to say, hey, brother, hey, sister, you're wrong. What you're saying here, what you're teaching here, what you're practicing here, this is wrong. Here's what the Word of God says about this. Amen. And that's not hate, guys. That's not putting someone down. That's love. Jesus said, I want you to love one another the way I loved you. And you know what he did? He corrected them. We talked about it when he washed their feet. That we've got to be able to, number one, we've got to be able to have our feet washed. We've got to be able to let the word of God minister to us once in a while. In order, and then once we've done that, then we got to be able to do it to one another. Amen. I can't be so proud and puffed up that if somebody says, look, the Bible says this and here's what's happening in your life, it's not right, and say, who are you to correct me? I'm rejecting love. He spoke the truth to them in his teaching and preaching, even though so many times it was hard. You remember John chapter 6 when he was teaching and preaching and all of those disciples said, Ooh, this is a hard saying. And they all went away. And there he's left with just the handful of his, his apostles again, his disciples. Will you go away too? Well, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. But it wasn't that it was a, it was a hard saying for them too. Amen. Can, I, can I say this? And I'm just being very open here to say this in this crowd, okay? Don't just walk out of church because something was said that you don't like or it, it hit you the wrong way. Don't do that. Amen. Don't do that. Sometimes teaching and preaching is just sharp and it cuts and it hurts, but it's in love. Amen. It's in love. And I hope by now, if you don't know my heart for you by now, I don't know that you'll ever know my heart for you. If I say something and I preach something and it happens to touch something in our lives together, our interactions with each other, I love you. I am not hurting you. And I am not trying to single you out. The chances are that there's a dozen other people in the church that have had the exact same thing take place. Can, we, can, we, can I say that today? Can we receive that? He spoke the truth to them by teaching and preaching. He was always trying to help them out. He just had the greatest love. He had humble service toward them. That was the love of Christ. Now, he said this, as I've loved you, you love one another. You take the example that I've given you, and you do that with each other. And when you do that, this world, all men, he says, will know that you're my disciples. It's not because we dress the right way. So what? This doesn't make me a disciple of Jesus Christ. This doesn't make me a disciple of Jesus Christ. This is garb. This is hanging on a dying, broken down body. You could dress a monkey in this 
and it wouldn't make them a Christian. It wouldn't make them a disciple of Jesus Christ. we got to be careful because we start looking on the exterior things. We start looking on this evidence, that evidence. And God said to us, if you really want every man to know that you're my disciple, love one another the way I loved you. Amen. That's what's needed. Now, <laughs> we tend to go light on love with one another. That's just the way we happen to be. And church, I'm exhorting you this morning, examine the life of Christ and the things that he did that evidenced his love and let's start absorbing that. Let's let the Spirit of God work that out in us and it's going to be uncomfortable. But when we do that, this world will look on and they'll say, that is true Christianity right there. You know what Jesus, I'm way off track here, but you know what Jesus did not come to do? He did not come to die to establish a denomination so that we could argue and fight and carry on over who's right and who's wrong. Amen. He died to save sinners. Amen. He died to help us so that we would be able to see sinners saved as well. And there's a lot of fussing and fighting and carrying on that takes place among brethren. I don't mean the brethren church. I mean brethren the saved. Amongst brethren, us that are saved, and the world goes, what's the difference? I've already got that. I've got strife and carrying on. I got all that in my home. What do I need to go there and get it for? People should know the love of Christ through us by the love we have for each other. And, and, and I'm a hard person to love. And some of you are hard to love. Amen. And that's why we need to do it the way Christ did it, because those disciples weren't very easy to love either. But he did it anyway. Are we okay? Amen. You know, John, John took that lesson... And again, under the power of the Holy Spirit, he wrote about it in his epistle, 1 John. He told us in 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, I was going to go here, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to do that. But 1 John chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, he said that love for one another is the only certain way to walk in the light. If we aren't, if we aren't loving the brethren, we are not walking in the light. Amen. And he said, if you say you are, you're a liar. He said in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 10 that love for one another, get this now, is in doing righteousness. Do you know that I love you when I do right? When I live my life in the eyes of God in the right way, that shows that I love you. Because I know that we are we're connected in Christ in this body of Christ that we're connected in, if I'm not living my life right, you may not even know it, but it's affecting you. Amen. And if you're not living right, it's affecting everybody here as well. If I really want to evidence my love for you, I'm going to live in light of righteousness. Yeah. And the third thing, and there's others, by the way, but these were the three I really wanted to focus on. Love for one another will be revealed by our obedience to God. If you really want to say you love one another, obey God. That's in 1 John chapter 5, verses 2 to 3. You know, what, you know what I won't do? You know what I won't do if I love you, church? I won't commit adultery. You know what I, what I will not do? I won't commit adultery because I know that that adulterous act is going to affect each one of you. It's going to affect me. It's going to affect my children. It's going to affect my wife. It's going to affect the person I commit adultery with. It's going to affect everybody they're associated with. It's going to give, as the Bible says, the enemies of God reason to blaspheme, occasion to blaspheme. The world's going to be affected by it. You know what? If I really love, I'm not going to commit adultery. 
if I really love you, I won't fornicate. If I love you, get this, I won't lie to you. I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear because it makes you feel good. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear because I'm not going to lie to you. I love you. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to love you so much that I'm going to scour over the word of God and say, God, I want to know what I should be doing and what I shouldn't be doing. And by your grace, I'm going to do everything that you'll enable me to do because I love you and I love your people. And I think that's missing in a lot of churches. Let's move on in John chapter 13. For the sake of time, Jesus spoke now of Peter's denial. And his denial here is found in the first part of, as he speaks of the first part of verse 36, watch as he builds up to this. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Now stop right there. Do you notice what just happened there? Jesus made, it's a, it's a very short period of time. I'm going away. Where I go, you can't come. I'm giving you a new commandment. Commandment is that you love one another as I loved you. And that's how everyone's going to know that you're my disciples. Where's Peter? He's stuck back here. Amen. Where are you going, Lord? I do believe that this happens in the life of many Christians. We miss out on the commandment that's been given to us because we're stuck on something we just didn't understand. Yep. Amen. Or maybe it didn't sit well with us. And so he's, he, he's almost missed, uh, he's heard it, but he's stuck on where you're going. And it, it evidently bothered him so much, he feels compelled here, he's got to say something. And I want to, I want to give Peter the benefit of the doubt, because I still think that his heart's in the right place. He's trying to do the right thing, but he is so misguided. He's just not satisfied with what the Lord said to him. And there's many people today that are just like this. They're not satisfied with the Lord's simple statements. And so they begin pushing for more. And in their pushing for more, they're missing what the commandment was. Amen. You know, there's a lot of times that God says something to us that we don't have to know all the particular details about it. We just have to receive it and accept it the way it is. I mentioned this woman that I had the conversation with this past week. She said that the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, if it existed, she says, was a good thing that they should have eaten because how can you make a decision between a good and evil if you don't understand it? How do I know that it's a bad decision for me to jump in front of a simi going down the highway at 110? How can I possibly know unless I get out there and try it? I know because when I was a little boy, my parents said, don't go play in traffic. It'll kill you. I didn't need to know more than that. That was enough to satisfy. I don't want to get killed. Okay. I don't want to die. I don't need to see more than that. I've seen enough dead deer and kangaroos on the side of the road to know that I don't need to jump in front of a semi to find out whether or not that's so. Now, her statement was simply this. How can you make a decision between right and wrong, between good and evil, if you don't have that opportunity to experience it or see it or know more about it and understand it so that you can make it an educated moral decision? Because God knows what you and I don't know. And he put those boundaries around mankind because you don't need to know some things. Amen. You need to accept it. And if it means accepting it as a simple child, accept it as a simple child. Yes. Are we together? Yes. I hope we are. Peter, Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't go. Why do you have to probe it further than that? What more needs to be said to you, Peter? You're dwelling on this, and yet I've given you one of the greatest commandments that I've spoken in my earthly ministry. Now, that Peter did not miss this, I think I'm going to illustrate to you altogether here. 
Now, don't be one of those people who are pushing ahead all the time in pride, trying to get God to tell you more, tell you more, tell you more, tell you more, tell you more. Ultimately, it's not going to work out for your good. But how does Jesus reply at the end of verse number 36? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. So how does Jesus reply? Listen, Peter, it's not for you now. A time's coming. Don't get impatient. How is it that when we go to the Lord, we say, Lord, tell me why? Are we making demands of the Lord? Lord, explain to me now. Give this to me now. Why can't I not do this now? Why can't this happen now? And you push and push and push. He is the Lord, and He is not subject to our beck and call, and He does not owe us an explanation just because we don't grasp everything that He's saying at that time. And any parent knows that. Any parent has made a statement to their child and had a child say, but why? Because I said so. I don't owe you an explanation of things. And a rightly trained child will accept that. Beyond that, there's only a work that God can do here that Jesus can do. I'm going to do something, Peter, that if you followed me, you would fail anyway because I'm going to die for the sins of mankind. Amen. I'm going there. You can't go there, Peter. There are things that only God can do in our lives, and if he allows us to follow in those steps down the track, then praise the Lord for it. But if not, can we just rest Christians in knowing that there's only certain things that God can do? It's reserved for him. Now Jesus is going to reveal to Peter just how much he doesn't know about himself. And in verse number 37, he, Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? You know, this is Peter's ignorance and his pride. And can I say, don't, don't miss the point of this lesson. It's a little bit choppy, I get it. The whole purpose of this passage was because Jesus taught a new commandment that we love one another. I believe what we're seeing here is this. This is Peter's attempt to prove how much he loves. Amen. But he just doesn't understand. I want to go with you now. I'm not satisfied with the answer I'm getting. I want you to know, Lord, how much I love you. Why can't I go at thee now? Look at the end of verse number 37. I will lay down my life for thy sake. Yeah, yeah, I heard what you said about love. I'll show you how much I love you. I'll tell you how much I love you. I will lay down my life for you. Ignorance and pride. This is the second time in that night that Peter is arguing with the Lord. <laughs> he just doesn't learn. How about you? You ever argue with the Lord? Amen. Just cannot get it through my head. And you know, he's showing his impatience with the plan of God. Why cannot I do it now? He's showing his discontentment with the plan and the information of God. And his ignorant, prideful confidence comes out when he says, I will lay down my life for thy sake. I love you enough to die for you. Brethren, be careful of demanding things from the Lord right now. Being impatient and discontented. But hear me well. Be careful of boasting about your level of faith and your commitment to the Lord. You better be very, very careful about boasting how much you love Jesus Christ. I have heard so many people say, oh, I have great faith. Oh, I have so much love for the Lord. And I hear that, and I just, on the inside, I go, oh. Pride, arrogance, ignorance. Amen. All right? Now, listen, I, I want to be careful here. I don't want you to say, I don't want anybody to go, oh, we're not supposed to say I love the Lord. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying, don't go around saying, look how much I love the Lord. Let, let me show you, Lord, how much I love you. I'll die for you. Uh, uh, that's easy to say when we're sitting in a nice padded pew and we've got food in our bellies and warm clothes on. And, you know, that's pretty easy to say, isn't it? It's a whole lot different when you're standing around the fire with a bunch of heathen who are ready to kill the person that you're associated with. Amen. That is not quite so easy. Let a man that thinketh he stand take heed lest he fall. Amen. Can I say this to us this morning? We just do not know ourselves as well as we think we do. And we better accept what God said to us and trust his plan and leave it at that. And so Jesus reveals to him how much he doesn't know about himself. Verse number 38. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? I don't know if he's put his hand on Peter's shoulder, put his arm around him. I don't know if he belly laughed over it. <laughs> Are you going to lay down your life for me? Probably some compassion, knowing the Lord and just saying, oh, Peter. Kind of like with Martha, right? Oh, Martha, Martha, thou art troubled about many things. Maybe it was like that with Peter. Peter, will you lay down your life for me? Look at the verse. Verily, verily, four times in chapter 13, verily, verily, an unchangeable, irrefutable fact. And Peter would know this by now because he's heard the Lord say verily, verily throughout his ministry and he knows every time he says that, that's exactly how this goes down. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Wait a minute. Backward in the chapter. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, one of you will betray me. And Peter's like, wait a minute, who is it? Who's going to do this? Now it filters down a little way. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Peter, the value of the King James language, thee, Amen. you'll deny me tonight before the cock crow. Now, Mark says the cock crow twice. Don't let that... Don't let people who hate the Bible take your faith out of the Bible. There's two cock crowings in a Jewish calendar, one at night and one in the morning. The cock won't crow the second time. Here he just simply says that cock's not going to crow until you've denied me three times. So let's say we're 9 o'clock at night here, roughly 9 o'clock. Within nine hours, Peter you will say you don't even know who I am three times. You're going to lay down your life for me? How much do you love me, Peter? Mm. This is another prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. This would be another opportunity for Jesus to prove who he was. This would establish yet again his authority. Peter just didn't know his own weakness. He didn't know his own heart. He was wrapped up in what he believed about himself. But he was wrong. And if you and I, again, are not very careful about how we approach our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, we will run around boasting to everybody about how much we love, about how brave we are, about how strong we are, about how much faith we have. And we may find out sooner than we hope that we're nowhere near what we think we are. We ought not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. I'm not nearly the man that I wish I was. I'm not nearly the man that I think I am. And God will reveal it. 
I am not discouraging you from loving the Lord. I am not discouraging you from taking a stand for the Lord. I am not discouraging you from growing in faith in the Lord. I am simply telling you, if we are not careful, we'll be like Peter, and we will take this commandment and say, sure, I love the Lord. Let me show you. I love him so much. I do this. I do that. I would do that if I had to. Wait. You and I, we just don't know ourselves as well as we think we know ourselves. Because love isn't about what we think we will do. Our love for one another is based on how we carry out the example of Jesus Christ to each other. Amen. Jesus wasn't asking Peter to lay down his life for him. Not yet. Later. Not yet. So why is Peter then overstepping the boundaries and making those statements? It's pride, arrogance, and ignorance about himself. Hmm. You're going to deny me. You're going to contradict me. You're going to disown me. You're going to refuse or neglect to acknowledge me. You are not going to confess me. Peter, you will say you don't even know me and you will cuss and swear as you're saying it. If he lacked love for the Lord to this degree, it's likely he was going to need to grow in his love for the brethren as well. And that's why I believe this whole passage is linked together. If you can't love the Lord enough to confess him before sinful men, then you better not go boasting about how much you love the brethren. Amen. He's perfect. Jesus is perfect. And still, still, we deny him. We deny him sometimes in action, sometimes in words, sometimes in our behaviors, we deny him. And he's perfect. Amen. I want to be very careful about boasting about my love for the brethren when I'm a denier of the Lord in my life. Peter, you don't love me enough to say, yes, I know the man. How can I trust you to love the brethren if you won't even say that? Amen. And I leave you with that today, Christian. How can we say we love the brethren when we have these times in our life that we're denying the Lord? I'm not pointing my finger at anybody. You understand? I know we do it. So he gives us a new commandment and he says to us, listen, I want you to love one another the way I love you and I'll never deny you. I'll confess your name before my Father in heaven. I am happy to call you brethren. I'm happy to be associated with you, little children. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by the love you have one for another. And I put my hand up right now in closing to say this. I know I need to grow. I need to grow in my love for the brethren. I know that. And maybe you'd say that too. Father, I pray that you'd help us today to just let the Spirit of God examine our hearts. And that, Father, we would be honest with ourselves. I think there's a whole lot more of Peter in most of us than we care to admit sometimes. And uh, we have that same spirit. God, I, I know we want to boast. Sometimes we want to exclaim. We want to we try to make it look like we're something that we're not. And we don't need to. We don't need to. We just need to yield to you. We just need to love the way you told us to love. God, if we loved you the way we were meant to, we would surely love the, the brethren the way we're meant to. God, would you work in our hearts in this matter, I pray. I'm going to ask that heads are bowed.